Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Greetings and welcome to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and Family Talk is the broadcast division of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Here at Family Talk, we strive to encourage and equip families to walk out their faith at home, at work, at school, even in their communities. Your prayers and financial contributions allow us to continue our mission. Thank you so much for your prayers and your financial support. Today's broadcast of Family Talk was recorded at the 2021 National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Dallas, Texas. It features a conversation between our co-host, Dr. Tim Clinton, and writer, director, and film producer, Dallas Jenkins. Now, Dallas has been producing and directing for almost two decades, but his most recent and most successful project is one that you're probably well aware of. It's the incredible crowdfunded TV series called The Chosen. The Chosen is the first ever multi-series TV show about the life of Christ. To date, it has been viewed nearly, are you ready for this, 200 million times and has received very positive reviews from both film critics and fans alike. Today, Dr. Clinton will discuss with Dallas Jenkins the incredible story behind the making of The Chosen and why he believes people have been so drawn to this TV show about the greatest story ever told. Dallas, pretty exciting to be here at uh, National Religious Broadcasters event. And hey, to see a lot of what's happening with you and uh, The Chosen. I saw a set outside. What in the world's going on? That's a really good question. I'm still trying to make sense of it all myself uh, because this was birthed out of my biggest career failure. I mean, I had done a movie that had bombed at the box office. I didn't know if I had a future at all. I did a short film for my church's Christmas Eve service about the birth of Christ. That ended up going viral and uh, financing season one of The Chosen. Now we're in the middle of season two. I I, I wish I had time to think about it for a second, but I feel like right now I'm just trying to do my best to follow and listen. God and everything else is taking care of itself. Well, it's more than impressive. The Chosen is the largest, most successful crowdsourced fundraising campaign for a film production ever. About $10 million have been raised to date. You mentioned season so, yeah, one, the, two. So the ten million was for season one. For season yeah, one. Yeah. So since then, um, it's been season two. Now season three million. is yeah. being funded, right? Yeah. So season three, we're a little over halfway funded for that. We and yeah, season two, we've we've finished uh, producing and uh, it's being released now. Uh, yeah. You know, stepping back, uh, you had mentioned you were at a place in your life where you thought maybe um, this is kind of over for me. Yeah. And then something happened. Take us way back. Because there's always backwater. And then, but God. Yes. Yeah. We call it uh, the I was, but God, and now. And the I was, was January of 2017. I had been making movies for about 15 years, had had some success, but it was all kind of outside the Hollywood system a little bit, independently done. And finally, I got a chance to make a movie with some of the biggest producers in Hollywood. They financed it. They produced it. They were excited about it. The movie tested through the roof. Mm. It, they, had, were, they were saying, look, we want to make multiple movies with you over the next 10 years. I mean, I was, I, I was a director with a very bright future. And, uh, and then the movie came out in January of 2017. And in the first couple hours, you can see what the numbers are and what they're going to be. And it was a total bomb. Uh, I was, I'm home alone at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday with my wife and we're crying and we're praying and confused going, it's all this seems so God ordained. And this movie itself is a God honoring project. It's the gospel and it's produced by Hollywood. Isn't this amazing? And then it just failed. And all of these companies backed out. I, I suddenly was a director with no future. And that's where God more than ever in my life intruded and in the best way possible, and laid something on my wife's heart, um, really pointed us to the story, the feeding of the 5,000 in the Gospels, and we, a story we've read you know, hundreds of times. But what we noticed about the story this time around that I hadn't really thought of before was that the hunger that those people were facing, the 5,000 people, depending on how you want to count how many people were there, but they were desperate and hungry, so hungry that Jesus said, if I send these people home to get food, they'll faint along the way. That's how hungry they were. Well, the hunger was actually a result of Jesus. Jesus was the one who'd been talking for three days. He was responsible for that actual hunger, Hmm. which led them to the place where the only thing left was a miracle. 
And I believed that that's what God was telling us, was that sometimes Jesus actually brings us to that place purposefully, that desperation, sure. that hunger. And so I think what we had been thinking was, oh, because this movie failed, because we're so desperate right now, God must not have been in this. But we got this reminder that, no, no, God was actually part of this too. But we weren't sure what that meant. We weren't sure where the next step was. Until at 4 o'clock in the morning that night, as I'm doing a 15-page memo about everything that I had done wrong, uh, putting myself to blame for a lot of it, and I think I was right to sit to do so. But I'm analyzing it all, and I get this Facebook message out of the blue. No, uh, hello, no, heard about your movie. All the Facebook message said was from someone who I've never met, just a Facebook friend, said, remember, your job is not to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish. And I thought, did my wife and I tell someone what we'd been praying about and reading all day long? Fascinating. Like, and we hadn't told anybody. And I, so I go, I said, what are you doing up at four in the morning, first of all? And he says, well, I'm in Romania. I'm on a different time zone. I said, can I ask you why you shared that with me? And he goes, oh, no, no, that wasn't me. That was God told me to tell you that. He had been walking home from a, a grocery store in Romania, looked up the box office results for my movie, saw that it hadn't done well. He said, God just laid it as explicitly on his heart as possible. Tell Dallas it's not your job to feed the 5,000. It's only provide the loaves and fish. And this gentleman named Alex said, wait a minute. I barely know this guy. You really want me to do this? It's a little bit presumptuous. And he, God was just like, tell him. So he sends me this Facebook message. Didn't expect to hear from me within 10 seconds, but I did. And that moment changed my life. That moment I can look at who I was before then and who I've been since then. Because when I was informed of this concept, it's not your job to feed the 5,000. It's only provide the loaves and fish. I believed it. I really clung to that. And I realized that my job is solely to make the best loaves and fish that I can, and that when you present them to God, and he deems them worthy of acceptance, the transaction's over. What he does with that is up to him. Mm. And if you can really get to a place in your life where you're focused solely on pleasing God and doing what he calls you to do, and what he does with it is not your business, where you're at in five years is not your business, it becomes a superpower. And I got to a place where I genuinely didn't care if I ever made another movie. I was willing to, to have an uncertain future. I was willing to say, okay, God, whatever you want from me, I'll do. And it's a scary place to be, but for me, it's where I found the most joy. And that's where I became willing to do a short film for my church, which felt like a big step down from a, from a Hollywood production on my friend's farm in Illinois, 20 minutes from my house. But that short film is what ultimately generated the $10 million in crowdfunding that shattered the all-time crowdfunding record. And uh, now that the show is into season two and it's in every country in the world, all of these things all were rooted in and birthed out of my biggest failure. And I think when I got to that place where I said, okay, God, I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to not even make movies if that's what you want. I think he said, all right, now you're ready for The Chosen. Love that. And that's where, that's where I am today is this, I'm, I'm a broken, surrendered man perfectly happy to do whatever God wants, and it doesn't matter to me if it's successful or not. So for all those people out there probably turning the dial up a little bit, saying, what in the world are they talking about? Let's step back. Maybe they haven't heard about or seen the right. series, The Chosen. Right. Tell our listeners what it's all about. Yeah. Okay, we got, we got the backwater story right. here about how it came about. Right. What is it? So the short film I did for my church was about the birth of Christ, but from the perspective of the shepherds. So the beginning of the short film starts with the shepherds that morning taking their sheep to Bethlehem, to the marketplace, yeah. presenting their lambs for sacrifice. When it got to the point in the story of the Bible where the angels appear and the shepherds go and, and meet the, the Christ child, that moment became so impactful for people because they knew the backstory, because they heard about some of these people, these shepherds and who they were, the things that aren't necessarily included in scripture. Right. And so it, while I was doing it, I thought, boy, there's really something there. Like, what if we did more of this? And that's where I came up with the idea for this multi-season show about the life of Christ, where, yes, it's rooted in Scripture. We start with the stories from Scripture, but we're going to give cultural context. We're going to give historical context. So when you see most Jesus movies, they go from Bible verse to Bible verse, miracle to miracle, which is how the, the, the Gospels are, because the Gospels are essentially designed to be Jesus' greatest hits to prove that he's the Son of God. But what we wanted to do was give you some of this backstory. And so that's the conceit of the show, which is we're going to be seven seasons. We're two seasons into it right now, rooted in Scripture. But yes, we do add to these stories in a way that I believe in what our viewers are telling us 
actually brings you back to scripture. We hear from people every single day, I'm reading my Bible more than ever now. And I think there's probably a listener right now who's thinking, wait a minute, if there's stuff that's not in scripture, how can I trust it? You know, I, I, I want to, I'm a Bible believer and I want to read the Bible. I don't need anything more. And I understand that. And I'm a Bible believer too. And I think that's what is causing people to respond so well to the show, which is that even the content that doesn't come from scripture, it comes from history or culture or comes from some artistic imagination is rooted in this foundational principle. I never want to contradict the character or intentions of Jesus or the gospels. And I, this show will never be a replacement for scripture. Of and we course. say that right up front. So yeah. that's the key. And so I think um, when people watch this show, they're going to watch a show that feels like a historical drama, like anything you'd watch on Netflix or on television, but it is rooted in the truths of God's word. And when you get to those Bible stories, after you've seen some of this backstory, it makes those moments even more impactful. And it draws you back to God's word. And, and this is a family show. This is, you know, family talk. And what we're hearing from parents is, my eight-year-old watches this show. My 10-year-old uh, watches this Something about the authenticity mm -hmm. of it. We had Rabbi Jason Sobel yeah. on the program not long ago talking about the life of Christ. He mentioned the chosen. Yeah, he's one of our primary Bible and cultural consumers. You know, and as he stepped back and looked at the life of Christ, you know, how it moved him personally. Right. And what an engaging conversation. I see that coming to life in film. Yeah. Let's talk about media and arts just for a moment because. If we don't take back the media and arts, we lose, basically. Uh, you guys are stepping into this, bringing this alive, and it's like people can't help. You can't help but encounter Christ, right. and that's the gift here. Right. One or two of the most moving scenes or pieces that you've produced so far. Well, that's a good question. I mean, that's what I, I listen to what the audience tells us. I know that um, in season one, uh, there are two moments that I think stand out for people the most, and one of them is in the very first episode. We see Mary Magdalene. We're introduced to her before she encountered Christ. So in the Bible, all it says is Mary Magdalene and several other women were following Jesus, helping finance his ministry. And when they mentioned Mary, they said she'd had seven demons cast out of her. Yes. They don't talk about what happened before that. We don't know that story. So we introduce you to Mary Magdalene. And uh, there's a moment when she encounters Christ and how he claims her as his and how you know, I think as, as believers, we oftentimes have to remember that our, our sin nature, uh, it's not enough to say, all right, I never want to sin again. I'm going to say no to this, no to that, no to that. We have to replace it with something or we have to replace it with someone. And that's that moment that we see in episode one of season one where Mary's demons are replaced by the God of the universe. Uh, and that it was a key moment, an impactful moment for people who could identify. And that's the key with this show is when you see Jesus through the eyes of those who actually met him, and if you can actually identify with them, then you can also identify with the answer. You can identify with their struggles. Uh, you can identify with the solution to their struggles, which is, of course, the Savior. And so that's the key is I want to put you into the eyes and ears and sandals of the people who actually walked with Jesus, which leads us to, I think, uh, one of the other key moments of season one, which has blessed a lot of people, is the encounter between Nicodemus and Jesus uh, mm -hmm. at night. John chapter three, the most famous chapter in the Bible, which again, we give you that backstory. We give you the context of who Nicodemus was. How could a Pharisee, a teacher of teachers, most of whom did not believe Jesus was the Son of God, believed he was actually a threat. What would have caused him to actually believe? Would have wanted to meet with Jesus, but yet under cover of night because he needed to keep it secret. So we give you that backstory. And then we show that scene, famous scene from Scripture, which now has more resonance when you know some of the backstory and cultural context. And the moment uh, when Jesus delivers uh, the greatest truth of all time, which is God loved the world and gave his Son. Yeah. That moment when it hits Nicodemus and he realizes that he's standing on holy ground Truly, and that he's this facing is the Son of God. Yes, I think those are two of the probably uh, th those two are on the Mount Rushmore of moments from the chosen so far that people have commented on as saying that drew me closer to Christ. That made me so. I, I loved as you said earlier about Jesus uh, dwelling among us. You know, we talk about the word Emmanuel, which is typically a Christmas term, but that's what this show is. The show is us. Emmanuel, God with us, because we sometimes forget that the God of the universe is not only to be revered, which is a good thing, but he's also to be dwelt with. He's also to be communicated with. We have a direct access to the creator of the universe, and that's what I think this show is ultimately about. You mentioned Mary Magdalene. One of my favorite scenes in Scripture is when Mary uh, goes to the tomb. Mm -hmm. The Lord asks her, who are you seeking? And uh, my Lord, where have they taken him? Where have you placed him? Yeah. And he says her name, Yeah, Mary. 
she I couldn't mean, see him at first, but it's when he calls her name that she now God. knows exactly who he is. And he knows my name. Yeah. And he sees me in those troubled moments. That's yeah. coming alive on screen here. Yeah. What do you think makes The Chosen more unique uh, as compared to, say, other pieces of work that have been done yeah. on film? Well, I grew up as a strong believer. I mean, I grew up in a Christian home. I've seen all of the Jesus movies and sure. miniseries, and some of them are wonderful, some of them not so much. Um, but one of the things that I always felt was lacking when I watched them was Jesus always felt so formal and emotionally distant. Um, he was typically uh, a European guy in these movies who spoke King James English, and uh, it wasn't someone that I felt had the 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 tenderness, or I hope you understand what I mean when I say this, the charisma. The warmth. Um, yeah, the warmth, the engagement that I think the that... dynamic that's... Yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, I, he doesn't seem like someone I would, I would follow, you know? And I, I always thought that was lacking, and I thought, that's the Jesus that I feel like I know, or at least that I want to know, and the Jesus that I read about in Scripture, thousands of people were flocking to him. Children loved him. Um, I, I just, I didn't see that in these, in most of these Bible projects. And because also the Bible projects tended to go miracle to miracle, I never got to know the people who were being impacted by Jesus. And so there was this kind of emotional distance when you watch it. And I think what is unique about The Chosen, what people tell us all the time, is that because we're seeing the backstories of these people and we're seeing the humanity of these people, when you can realize that these were human beings like us, I think we forget that. I think we sometimes deify them in many ways. You see them treated as saints. Uh, you see them as, as paintings. And what we're doing is we're saying these were real human beings. They had families. Uh, they had struggles. They were financially struggling. They had the same struggles and sins and vices that we do. And they walked with the creator of the universe. And so we can do that too. And I think that's what this show is doing for people is they always say the show feels authentic. The show feels like real human beings, and I'm guessing you felt that when you watched it, is, yeah. huh, this feels like something I can, I can see and feel and touch. Um, it doesn't feel like a glossed over, uh, flanagraph Sunday school telling of this story. This feels real. And that's what I would say is probably the biggest difference with this show, is it feels, t it feels very real. And I think it's, in for me, as a, someone who grew up with these projects, um, it's a reaction to those in many ways. It's a, I want you to be there. Uh, and I had, I didn't always feel that. Uh, you do feel that when you, when you watch this, when you engage it, you know, I've had the privilege of having a conversation with Randall Wallace. Yeah, of course. Another friend of mine is Michael Landon Jr. Yeah. I don't know if you know Michael, but Michael's a good friend. Yeah. And they talk about screen and what they try to accomplish. I remember asking Randall, he said, Tim, it's really about what's the cry of that soul. I'm right. trying to meet that deep need. Yeah. You know, and bring it to life. Here you've got the story again, the greatest story ever told. Yeah. Uh, he has set eternity in our hearts. Yes. And I think that's the emotional connection, but you bring it to life in such a unique way that it's alive in our, right. our way of understanding. And, and I think one of the things that Randall Wallace does so beautifully, and Michael Landon Jr. as well, is um, they're tapping into that deep need and they're, and they're giving answers to that deep need. Uh, and that's what any good storyteller does. What I think is happening with The Chosen, and I think with what's happening with most uh, projects that resonate with people, is sometimes it h hits a need that they're not even aware of. And what we're seeing all over the world is people from all different faith traditions, uh, including people who don't have a faith tradition, people who, who aren't believers, but who are resonating with this show, and they're saying, I didn't even know that I could relate with Jesus in this way. And this show is breaking down religious walls and barriers, most of which were constructed after Jesus was here. But when you're focused solely on Jesus, and the, I like to use the term uh, that's from Scripture, uh, the scales being removed from your eyes, because you know, that was Saul, after he encountered Jesus, um, Ananias came in and removed the scales from his eyes, and he was able to see. And that really is my heart's cry. I want Love the that. chosen to I remove the scales from your eyes. And sometimes those scales are put there by religion. And I want you to be able to see Jesus unvarnished, direct, with no cultural barriers, no religious barriers. And we're going to see Jesus for who he is. And that's what's happening around the world. And the relationship with him that can be had. Yeah. The gospel. Tell us about your statements up front, what you want to make sure people know. Yeah. It is about that message. Yeah. Well, this show is a failure if it doesn't ultimately point you yeah. to Jesus and to the Bible. This show is not a replacement for Scripture. Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus, is not Jesus. 
Uh, I am not the author of the Bible. I am the creator of a show that is rooted in scripture, but is ultimately a TV show. And it's made by flawed human beings. A lot of our cast and crew aren't even believers. I mean, this is a collection of people who are just here to, we are, we're trying to make a show that's going to ultimately uh, point you to the savior of the, of the universe. And if it doesn't do that, then there's no point. Um, but what I'm trying to do is uh, I think what's plastered on the walls of each of us involved is we want to reach a billion people with the authentic Jesus. I love that. And the authentic Jesus, like I said, what just a now, calling. is yeah. And what pleases me the most, or what, what is my heart's cry, is when I hear from parents who are saying, you know what, my teenager watches a show with me now. Yeah. And my six-year-old, which I didn't expect, and I didn't think the show was for kids, because the show is actually quite complex in its storytelling. It's an adult show. It's not inappropriate, but it's an adult themed show and yet they're saying you know my 12 year old had a birthday party and made it a chosen themed birthday party and they all dressed up in bible era costumes <laughs> and they i mean i'm like <laughs> what more could i want than that is is to see parents go i now have a tool in my toolkit in introducing my children to jesus and then i've got this show that's engaging them and now they're saying is that in the bible is that seen from the bible and they're going to say this part is from the bible this part isn't let's look into the god's word and see what it says about it now they're engaging more than ever and that's that's, that's Two more things I want to ask you, Dallas, absolutely. and uh, one is um, your talent, uh, participating. Have you seen any stories come out of it? How can you participate and not encounter yeah. the message of the right. cross? It's really interesting. Um, Jonathan Rumi, again, who plays Jesus, who I mentioned, is the first to tell you he's not Jesus, of course. And these actors are not actually the people that they're portraying. But something has happened multiple times on set, I'd say at least a dozen times where there's a scene where Jesus is asking someone to follow him, or Jesus is healing someone's disease, or Jesus is saying things that we know are from Scripture. And these actors will have these profound emotional experiences and reactions that aren't in the script, that they didn't plan for, that they don't even fully understand. And they'll say to me, like, I'm sorry, I couldn't get that through this. That kind of gives me chills. No, they'll, say, seriously, man. no they'll say, I couldn't get through that scene without crying. I'm so, I don't know what it was. And I'm like, yeah. I'm able to actually share with them, some of them of say, well, I know exactly what it was. I said, when you're faced with the choice to follow or not follow, I know this is just a scene. I know it's an, I know, but, but these are words of scripture. And I believe that this actually happened. And uh, several of them are saying, yeah, I didn't know some of this stuff. And I'm reading the Bible. Is this true? And where is this coming from? And uh, yeah, we've had at least a dozen significantly emotional, profound moments. Uh, actors telling me, I don't even know where that came from. And we don't want to over-spiritualize the moment itself because, again, I, I want to make it, I want to say this repeatedly. This is not the Bible and Jonathan is not Jesus. But I think when you're faced with something, and when you're faced especially with Scripture, uh, God gets past all of those barriers, including the barriers of film cameras and scripts and crew standing around, and he's, he's piercing your heart. And I think that that's, uh, that's something that's happened multiple times on our, on our set. Well, we will pray that God will continue to work, and there's a great fidelity to the greatest story ever told. Absolutely. Dallas, let's end this way. Um, a lot of people might be saying, I've never even seen it. How do I watch this thing? How do I get involved in the series? Streaming app, whatever. Yeah, so The Chosen isn't actually on Netflix or your traditional television networks. Uh, we did this all completely outside the system, which the good news about that is, is we are, we are beholden to nobody. We get to just, we don't have to follow Hollywood's rules about how we do this. But if you want to see the show, you just go to wherever you get your phone apps. So Google Play, uh, App Store, whatever, and you look up The Chosen. We're easy to find. You download it to your phone. Now I know you're thinking, I don't want to watch a show on my phone. Well, it connects directly to your streaming device. So if you've got Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Chromecast, whatever, it'll connect directly from your phone so you can watch it on your TV. Now, if you're old school and you'd prefer to just watch, a watch it on DVD, we've got that as well. So uh, I don't want to give people a bunch of websites because they'll, you know, they'll forget them anyway. But if you just look up The Chosen, we're very easy to find, and you can get the DVDs if that's what you prefer. But the show is completely free if you want to watch it on the app, uh, on your television through the app. No sign-up, no, e no subscription, no email address, no nothing. Completely free and easy to access. A special guest again today is American film and television director, writer, film producer, Dallas Jenkins. And uh, we've been talking the whole broadcast about The Chosen. Man, may God continue to lead you guys and bless this for His glory. Thank you so much. What a delightful interview. Um, on behalf of Dr. Dobson, his wife Shirley, their family, our team here, we salute you guys. And, uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me.
an incredible testimony of God's faithfulness from writer, director, and producer Dallas Jenkins on today's edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. We hope that you've been encouraged by Dallas's story and that you've been reminded of the importance of obeying God and then trusting Him with the outcome. By the way, if you want to learn more about Dallas Jenkins or the Chosen TV series, visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. And while you're there, you can also listen to any part of the program that you might have missed. Again, that's drjamesdobson.org forward slash broadcast. Thanks again for listening today, and be sure to join us again tomorrow for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.